Welcome back to the shop. I invite you to pull up a stump around the fire. We're going to explore the real reason Friday the 13th is unlucky. In our collective Werkstatt of bumblefuckery, we tear down interesting tits of kit right down to bits to understand the, the complex whole. That's deconstructionalism. <laughs> Not uh, the complex hole in the Freudian slip of the tongue and bung. Hey, sometimes a cigar is just a cigar. So let's uh, tear down this utterly bizarre and frankly occult fascination with Friday the 13th. I'll open a portal of synchronicities obscured by our empirical ignorance. Ignorance, you ask? Yeah, superstition. It can't be explained by scientific empiricism because science, as espoused by the likes of Newton or Bacon, is a measurement of natural phenomena. Scientific measurement, what affords the building of a model, a mental model of the world. The problem with science is you need to measure the natural world with the proper scale. So I says to Maud, I says, how fast is the Millennium Falcon? Well, it'll do the Kessel Run in 1.21 gigawatts. If you use the wrong scale, or if you need a unit Oh, it hasn't been invented yet. You get nonsense, and you got to ignore the answer. It's a divide by zero type deal. Doesn't fit the model. You must ignore it, or the scientific model collapses under the weight of its own suppositions. Is it a wave, or is it a particle? It's neither. It's both. Well, the answer is it depends on the observer. That's critical. Hey, what size door do you want for your cabin? 20 kilograms. <laughs> Science is measurement and some things can't be measured. Recall that all models are wrong, however, some are useful. So we'll use an esoteric model to explain the bad juju what is Friday the 13th. Jeebus, the Messiah to some, had 12 buddies over for supper and it kind of got into some heavy shit, which is transmorgified now into the most important Catholic ritual, that is transubstantiation of the host into the Eucharist, the body and blood of Christ, which is consumed in an austere and contemplative sacred cannibalism uh, as a lapsed Catholic, sidebar, communion is really fucking weird, but weirder still is witnessing your own father call a late and pedophilic narcissist with the honorific father, that is a 20-something seminarian with a fetish for resplendent regalia and daggone fish hats. Buddy, you ain't anybody's father, let alone my father's father. <laughs> There's some, yeah. Back to the Last Supper, 12 apostles and Jesus makes the 13th before the cock crowed thrice, he was betrayed. The New Testament Last Supper narrative parallels with the Norse myth, the Norse Viking myth of Balder. Freya, the mother goddess, now cloying and overbearing to her beautiful son Balder, the golden boy, I will always love you, but you can never leave me. Now, fearing Baldur's continually dreaming of his death, now the annihilation drive, the death drive, we see in everyday life in boys of narcissistic mothers. We see a boy with no regard for his own safety, an utter lack of consciousness, stumbling over fall, self-destructive adrenaline junkie. Some, some mummy issues there. Freya, a.k.a. Frigga, a.k.a. Venus, the god of love, beauty, sex, and fertility, extracts from every being an oath not to harm her dear golden boy, Balder. In exchange for what, I ask, what's the quid pro quo? There is none. It's a threat. So she sows the seeds of her son's own doom. Yes, I swear I won't harm Balder, brackets, but you damn sure somebody will. Don't threaten me. So the 12 main Norse gods get together 
to marvel at Baldur's invulnerability. Bruh, let me shoot this apple off your head. It's, it's just the 22. Loki arrives late. The 13th. Loki, the ever jealous trickster. Uh, jealousy is the drive of malicious tricksters. You'll see this in your everyday life. I'm smarter than you. How come nobody likes me? So I seditiously shame and humiliate you to subjugate my own humiliation and shame. They're projecting. Loki discovers in Freya's own hubris, she neglected the holly tree. In her own words, what possible harm could the lowly holly plant do to my perfect balder boy? Now the trickster makes an arrow of holly, and knowing the secret, he must not kill Balder, lest he be punished. So he enlists the aids of Balder's brother, a blind god, Hod, of night and darkness, knowledge obscure, the occult. He fires the holy arrow and kills Balder, stoned <laughs> dead. Unlucky. Now the etymology of the word luck is itself obscure, but I assert it's from a Germanic bastardization of Loki. Lucky. So, when the 13th visits on Friday, Frigga's Day in Germanic, or in Latin, Vendredi, Venus's Day, bad shit happens. Now that's a myth, a model, and it's wrong, but it is useful. The reason Friday the 13th is unlucky, now this has been suppressed, that is a cult, but it lies in historical fact. We'll pick up the thread with the building of the Temple of Solomon in Jerusalem. Solomon the Wise, 10th son of King David, built a great temple to house the Ark of the Covenant. Two stone tablets of the Ten Commandments, a Aaron's rod, and a pot of manna in that resplendent golden ark. Solomon was a magi, a magician. We read in the Wisdom of Solomon in the King James Bible, I'm paraphrasing from memory here. He hath given me certain knowledge, nature's creatures, diversity of plants and roots, the reasonings of men, all such things secret or manifest. I know them. Solomon notices during the construction of the temple a handsome master's work boy withering away. Queried, the youth explains he's plagued by a demon who steals half his ration and comes by night to suck his soul out of his right thumb. <laughs> now, <laughs> he's not actually talking about a thumb. The Solomonic texts are generally in Greek, ancient Greek. And in Greece, now in a lot of Europe, to give someone the fig is like telling, like flipping them the bird. It's offensive. With the thumb tucked between the finger, it's the vajayjay in dingus, mid-coitus, or as you fellow husbands and fathers of young children know, coitus interruptus. By coincidence, my son's middle name. So when the djinn comes by night to suck the soul, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, of the boy's right thumb. He is neither sucking soul nor, <laughs> nor thumb. If at first you don't succeed, keep sucking till you do succeed. <laughs> also, that's where the word sycophant comes from. A Greek meaning one who reveals figs. Get the fuck out of here. Basically, waste of spaces you give the finger to. They reveal the figs. Solomon beseeches to Geode, and Geode sends down the archangel Michael, gives him a ving with a seal on it, the seal of Solomon, to bind the demon plaguing the boy. Solomon devises a plan. That night, when the demon comes to suck the lad's thumb, He's to throw the ring into the demon's chest, thereby binding him. Now bound and drugged before Solomon, interrogated. And the demon reveals his true name. He's a nonce, a pedophile. His name means vexing, frustrating. Solomon 
and puts him to work building the temple, trimming stones with iron utensils. Demons and iron do not get along well, and the demon balks. Doesn't want to do that job. Beseeches Solomon that if he doesn't have to touch the iron of which he is so very afraid of, he will bring a host of demons to be bound and complete the temple. At one point, Solomon binds the prince of demons himself. So as demonstrated, the seal of Solomon is a powerful symbol. And we'll chat about that in the future. Uh, he goes on to bind a host of bad guys to build the temple. And these deals with the devil, they're not without cost. It ain't nothing in this world for free. Solomon is corrupted and he turns away from Hashem, the Tetragrammatron, 26, the God of his fathers. Thou shalt not marry foreign women. They will certainly turn your heart to other gods. Now Solomon had 700 princesses, 300 concubines, and sure enough, his wives turned his heart. Uh, one of Solomon's wives was the Queen of Sheba, who, whose line extends to the Emperor Haile Selassie. Ha, 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 it's, uh, the Ethiopian, he was born in 1892. It's the second coming of Christ, according to the Rastafari. The Lion of Judah, the Iron Lion of Zion, according to Bob Marley. The book of Exodus, chapter 20, verse 5, For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Just a little sidebar here. You can't be jealous if you're the only one in existence. I'm just saying. So Solomon, he turned to worshipping Moloch to please his wives. And Leviticus says, uh, paraphrasing, let not thy seed pass through the fire of Moloch. Pagan priests would light a fire in the seven-chambered, bullheaded bronze statue. Once it was good and hot, they would roast male and female human babies. Yeah. Not cool, man. Not cool. On a lighter note, after seven years of demonic slave labor, Solomon completed the temple, slid the Ark of the Covenant into the holiest of holies, sacrificed 22,000 oxen, 120,000 sheep, and called her good. <laughs> I was around 1000 BC. Now christened the first temple, <laughs> pun intended, it was destroyed in 500 BC by Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. The whore of Babylon, well, Sol suffice it to say, Solomon was a debauched magician, an author. His catalog of occult magic demons and motorcycle repair is still referenced to this day, both in literary form and graphic design. The lesser seal of Solomon is the fleur de lis, the hexagram, which is a powerful tool for interpreting the world. Uh, Hermes tried that, that fella, as above, so below. We will get into that, but suffice it to say, the wisdom of Solomon is very powerful for interpreting the world. Fast forward, 1099. Crusaders approach Jerusalem, the Egyptian governor orders livestock driven away and the wells poisoned. Additionally, nobody warned the crusaders in heavy European clothing and armor that it's hot in Palestine. Barren of trees near Jerusalem with no prospects for resupply and no timber for siege engines, the holy Roman warriors were fucked. After six weeks of siege outside the walls of Jerusalem, broiling in physical discomfort, word came that a host was marching from Cairo to break the siege. Demoralized, facing annihilation from Cairo, the crusaders fasted 
and prayed for three days. In humility, they trod, unshod, the perimeter walls of the holy city, while Egyptian defenders pissed on them, pissed on crosses, defiling their holy symbols to goad the pious knights. This was a brilliant distraction as a surge of craftsmen finished the construction of siege towers. The trees had been carried from the coast on the backs of Muslim slaves, 60 men to a tree over rough ground some hundred clicks away. Siege towers rolled into place. Crusaders poured into Jerusalem, piously butchering man, woman, and child. One report to the Pope read, Know that in the portico of Solomon and in the temple, our men rode through the unclean blood of Saracens, which came up to the knees of our horses. That is a gory temple. Uh, there was a rumor circulated that Muslims swallowed their gold as the surest way to hide it. Thereafter, disemboweling became economical practice at once uh, torture and treasure hunt. After the loot dispersed, the money really started pouring in. Pilgrims to the Holy Land required succor. It took about a couple decades and the well-established crusaders had a bustling business. The Knights Hospitaller decided they'd do more than provide lodging to pilgrims. They would fight to defend the Holy Land. At the same time, that same year, the poor fellow soldiers of Christ and the Temple of Solomon, that's a mouthful, <laughs> was established to protect pilgrims. The Knights Templar, as they became known, in their white robes, emblazoned with red Maltese crosses, swore never to remove their lambskin girdles, a symbol of their chastity. In the intervening 200 years, the Templar Order came to hold over 9,000 manors, the width and breadth of Europe, plus mills and foundries and markets. Over 20,000 initiates vowed poverty, bequeathing their lands and money to their glorious order. The Templars grew and grew and grew. They built strongholds and commissioned ships to move pilgrims, men and material. They became de facto bankers. Rich pilgrims would deposit their money lest it be stolen during their travels. And the Templars took contracts for tax collection. They issued paper money honored at any Templar stronghold. They made loans to every sovereign and potentate in Europe. By the 1300s, the Templars were suffering from bureaucratic bloat. Uh, the commander at the time, Jacques de Molay, decided another crusade would shake the complacency of the order. Uh, the previous one, ninth and final crusade, was some 30 years, well, we'll say 33 years, fnar fnar, previous. One such potentate who took loans from the Templars was the most powerful regent in Christendom, King Philip IV. His kingdom of France owed 17% of government revenue to the Templars. He was, in fact, he had fought a war with England and turned King Edward into a vassal. The powerful Templars were beyond the reach of secular kings. They were answerable only to the throne of St. Peter, that is, the Vicar of Christ, the, the Pope. And the Vicar of Christ means the proxy of a, a replacement on earth for the Christ, which is quite odd. But in any case, the Templars got pissed off with Pope Boniface the seventh, and they got with King Philip the fourth to knock off Pope Boniface in order to installate a puppet pope. Now the puppet pope sitting on the throne of St. Peter by virtue of some backdoor shenanigans by the King of France wasn't very well liked in Rome. So he had to abscond to Avignon. Newcastle of the Pope sounds like a cut-rate lager, but 
Chateau Neuf du Pape, I assure you, is a beautiful wine. Fabulously rich and powerful, the Knights of the Temple owed allegiance only to the Pope, not in Rome, but in Avignon. They were answerable to no king, despite having strongholds throughout Europe. King Philip of France devised a plan wherein he not only would default on his loans to the Templars, he would also steal all of their lands and geld. He did that by having a pope in his pocket. With great fanfare and by invitation, Jacques de Molay docked in Marseille. He was on a mission to secure approval from the new pope for another crusade. De Molay refused to travel incognito despite the new pope's requests. He proceeded to the Paris temple with 60 attendant Templar, their squires, 150 gold florin on 12 pack horses. The trap was set. King Philip feted the oblivious Templars, and on Thursday, October 12, 1307, the 70-year-old Templar Grand Master was amongst the highest nobility in all of Europe. The orders were unsealed and read out to be enforced on the following morning, endorsed by Pope Clement V. The Templars were charged with heresy, sodomy, obscene kisses, that is, uh, initiates. They were obliged to kiss the master on the mouth, the anus, the navel, and the tip of the dingus. That's um, occult, tantric, sex magic. We, it's still in existence today. Chili peppers, blood sugar, sex magic, suck my kiss, the, the Dalai Lama asking some innocent Indian boy to suck his tongue. The, the, these ideas go way, way back. On Friday, October the 13th, every Templar in France was betrayed by the Pope and King Philip. They were clapped in irons and tortured. The regent legally seized the heretical lands and money. He annulled his debts and hunted the Templars into legend. Jacques de Molay, Grand Master of the Templars, burned at the stake at the ripe old age of 77. This is at a time when the average lifespan was 40. The Templars shared a single bowl between two partners practicing uh, fasting and martial training on the daily. So, if you want to live long, stay skinny and <laughs> exercise. Surprise, surprise. And there's also, speaking of burning at the stake, there's a nasty epithet for homosexual med. It's now in disuse. Friday the 13th casts a long shadow, and that epithet that's still with us today comes from the burning at the stake of the Knights Templar. Revenge is a dish best served ice cold. During the French Revolution, King Louis XVI of the House of Bourbon, that's the cadet line of the House of Capet, those are direct descendants of Philip IV. King Louis was imprisoned during the French Revolution, arrested and imprisoned at the Paris Temple built by the Knights Templar in the 12th century. Louis was arrested the 13th day of August 1792. Unfortunately, it was a Monday. <laughs>